Hi all. So in this video we are going to see about blood brain barrier. So this question can be asked as a short essay like uh, explain the blood brain barrier and, and its significance or even as one word or MCQ questions. So let's see more about this. So blood brain barrier by definition it refers to a specialized and protective barrier between the blood and brain tissue. So it's basically a, a barrier between blood and brain tissue. That is why it is called blood-brain barrier. Now there is another barrier between blood and CSF also. So because CSF is a part of brain itself, this blood-CSF barrier also can be considered as a blood-brain barrier. So not only the barrier between blood and the brain parenchyma, the barrier between the blood and the CSF also can be considered as a blood-brain barrier. So the blood CSF barrier is basically the tight junction between the capillary endothelial cells in the brain and between the epithelial cells of the choroid plexus. See we know that the choroid plexus produces CSF right. So the barrier between this epithelial cells of choroid plexus and the endothelial cells of the blood vessel or the capillary that forms the blood CSF barrier. So this concept will be more clear using this diagram. So first we will see what is blood brain barrier or in a broader sense what is meant by the barrier between blood and the brain parenchyma. So see suppose this is a blood vessel showing the capillary endothelium. We know that we have got a continuous basement membrane. The endothelium also has got tight junctions. Then we have got the basement membrane and apart from that we also have got a, lay, the, a covering by the food process of, of the astrocyte. So we've got this uh, layer of astrocyte and then we've got this neurons which is pre present inside the brain. So see this is actually the blood brain barrier which is formed by the capillary basement membrane and the astrocytes. Okay. So this is the neuron and here we've got the interstitial fluid of the brain. So this forms the blood brain barrier. Now what is blood CSF barrier? See this is the suppose uh, this is the ventricular ependymal cells and here we have got the CSF. We know that the cerebrospinal fluid is present inside the lateral ventricles and all right. So suppose this is the ventricular ependymal cells of that ven of the lateral ventricle and this is the CSF. We know CSF is produced by the choroid cells okay so these choroid epithelium has got these tight junctions and also here also we've got the basement membrane and the capillary endothelial cells so this forms the blood csf barrier so in a broader term both blood brain barrier and blood csf barrier can be considered as the under one heading which is blood brain barrier but we usually focus on this one as a blood brain barrier Okay, so remember there are two, two, two barriers. One is blood brain barrier between the blood and the brain parenchyma and other is between the blood and the CSF. Okay, so now we will learn more about the constituents or components of this blood brain barrier. How does this uh, capillary endothelial membrane or the base membrane, membrane or the astrocyte produce such a barrier between the blood and the brain? We will see that. So, See suppose this is a non-brain capillary that means capillaries that are found elsewhere inside a body. You can see that in a normal capillary lipid soluble substances can easily diffuse out right. Not only that we have got fenestrated capillaries okay the, the capillaries has got small openings which are called fenestra and we have got intercellular clefts also. Apart from all these openings, the capillaries can also have a transcellular or transcytosis as possible. So there are many methods by which the capillaries can exchange substances with its exterior. If they are lipid soluble, they can easily pass out through the walls of the capillary. We've got fenestra, intercellular cleft and transcytosis for a normal non-brain capillary. But the difference for a brain capillary is that see you can see that first of all there are no fenestra right there are no openings or no clefts and here we've got these tight junctions also okay and the basement membrane is also really thick and is continuous so we've got a thick basal lamina we've got tight junctions and 
if substances have to move out of this capillary it has to be carrier mediated not transcytosis or uh, diffusion is not possible it has to be carrier mediated for the substances to pass out of this capillary and on top of that we've got these end processes of astrocytes which are surrounding them so see this is the astrocytic end food which is surrounding the capillaries so it is virtually impossible for substances to pass from the capillary to the brain tissue except for essential nutrients so the blood brain barrier is due to the endothelial cells or brain capillaries which are which have tight junctions they also have very few pores they have dense protein matrix present between the brain endothelium and the brain cells so see between the endothelium and the brain cells we've got a dense protein matrix also which prevents a uh, passage of substances and also we've discovered by the end foot of astrocyte so all this will contribute to the blood brain barrier so what are they we've got tight junctions no pores we've got a thick basal lamina or a dense protein matrix which is surrounding it and then we've got these astrocytic end foot so that these are the components of blood brain barrier so if so we, we have to know about the permeability so what are substances can actually pass through this blood brain barrier so now we're going to say about the permeability of substances so we know that of course this is a barrier but essential nutrients and uh, substances like carbon dioxide and oxygen must diffuse out right so we're going to see what are the substances that can diffuse out and how they diffuse out and what are the substances are that cannot be diffused out okay so first we'll see about the essential carbon dioxide and oxygen so carbon dioxide oxygen and other volatile anesthetics can pass easily because they are lipid soluble but what about the other ions so hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions penetrate slowly and other ions such as sodium potassium magnesium and calcium and even urea they pass slowly through specific transport mechanisms so for all these ions the, the, the ions cannot pass freely through this barrier they need specific transport mechanisms and they are transported slowly okay now what about the nutrients so nutrients like glucose they enter via facilitated diffusion so here also we've got a specific glucose transporter called glut 1 55k and glut 1 45k so these are the two transporters that are uh, present for the diffusion of glucose to the brain tissue okay and what about amino acids amino acids and other nutrients also are transported via specific carriers okay so now we'll see what are the substances that cannot pass so large molecules like plasma proteins or large organic molecules they will be blocked by these tight junctions okay and uh, what about other substances lipid soluble substances like alcohol and caffeine they can cross more readily than water soluble substances such as sucrose and inulin similar is the case for drugs also lipid soluble drugs such as certain antidepressants or anesthetics they can enter more easily than water soluble sub, uh, drugs like penicillin okay and there is one more point here we've got a specific transporter called p glycoprotein transporter p glycoprotein transporter it limits the entry of drugs and peptides into the brain it will avoid the entry of unnecessary drugs or proteins into the brain so if there is a problem with this transporter the brain tissue will be more affected by the drugs that uh, that is administered to the patient okay so to summarize uh, what all substances do these uh, blood brain barrier allow and uh, do not allow first you have to talk about carbon dioxide and oxygen it is freely diffusible because they are lipid soluble hydrogen ions and bicarbonates they are not easily diffusible and other ions are also transported through specific mechanisms and they are slow for glucose we've got the specific transporter glut uh, that 55k and 45k glut 1 55k and 45k then we've got amino acids and other nutrients for specific transport processes plasma proteins are not allowed lipid soluble substances are can easily be diffusible and same as a case of drugs so you have to write these eight points you have to remember these eight points when it comes to the permeability of blood brain barrier now there are some areas that are outside this blood brain barrier so we'll see what they are so here suppose this is an outline of the uh, in the in the interior part of the brain we can see that there are certain substances certain areas like median eminence and 
neurohypophysis which are devoid of blood brain barrier then we've got this OVLT or organum vasculosum of lamina terminalis is another area which is devoid of blood brain barrier then we've got this sub organ present here which is again devoid of uh, blood brain barrier and area prostrema which is present down here so all these areas are devoid of blood brain barrier is there any physiological significance for that let's see so see the median eminence and hypothalamus median eminence of the hypothalamus and the adjoining neurohypophysis neurohypo that means this area here basically the posterior pituitary now they are devoid of blood brain barrier is it useful yes because these areas have got to release the neurohormones right they have to release their hormones which is synthesized by the hypothalamus into the bloodstream so here the blood it, that it should be devoid of blood brain barrier otherwise it cannot release the hormone so this is called the neurohemal function release of neurohormones into the bloodstream okay now next area is area prostrema see this is an area which is a trigger zone for vomiting right so this area also it's a chemoreceptor trigger zone whenever the composition of the blood changes or whenever it has to you know protectively initiate vomiting the area prostima must be in contact with the con composition of the blood so that is why here also we've got the area is devoid of blood brain barrier Organovasculosum of lamina terminalis. Why should there be a deficiency of blood brain barrier here? Because it contains osmoreceptors, which in turn will control your vasopressin release. So, OVLT contains these osmoreceptors, which in turn has to find out the osmolality of the blood. So, that is why here also we do not have blood brain barrier. Subfornicial organ here also angiotensin 2 is supposed to be believed to act here. So, here again the subfornicial organ has to uh, has to understand the composition of blood so there again there is no blood brain barrier so these are the different areas which are devoid of blood brain barrier and its physiological significance medial eminence of neurohypophysis area prostrema ovlt and subfornicial organ see there are some other neural structures like pineal gland also which does not have the blood brain barrier but because it is not uh, you know com com uh, considered as a part of the brain we are not talking about that so of the brain these are the areas that are outside the blood brain barrier so what are the functions of blood brain barrier why should there be a blood brain barrier see it maintains the constancy of environment for the neurons in the central nervous system see we know that the neurons are highly susceptible structures uh, and thus it needs a constant environment for proper functioning so the blood brain barrier ensures that only things that are supposed to get in gets in and substances that are not supposed to get in is you know prevented by this barrier so it maintains a constancy of the environment it protects the brain from endogenous and exogenous toxins again we don't want any toxins to enter into a brain tissue or any drugs for that matter thirdly it prevents the escape of neurotransmitters into the general circulation we've got a lot of neurotransmitters present inside the brain tissue because that is how the synapse works so it prevents the escape of neurotransmitters into the general circulation and it influences the drug permeability into the brain so it uh, based on this blood brain barrier it decides which drugs should enter the brain tissue and not so these are the functions of blood brain barrier it maintains constancy of environment remember the toxins neurotransmitters and drugs okay and finally for the applied aspects what are the different applied aspects of this blood brain barrier See, I think you've know, learned about kernictris, right? What is kernictris? Kernictris is a condition in which when the fetus has got, uh, you know, uh, increased amount of bilirubin, it is going to affect the central nervous system. How? Because the blood-brain barrier is not fully developed in infancy and early childhood. So that is why when there is hyperbilirubinemia, the infants are more susceptible to have neurological deficits because, of, because the blood-brain barrier is not fully developed. So that is one applied aspect. Now there are certain conditions in which the blood brain barrier will be deficient in, in grown ups also. So what are they? So in adults in pathological conditions like brain tumors, at, at the site of tumor the blood brain barrier is absent because there is more angiogenesis or more vascularity in that area. So in brain tumors the blood brain barrier is absent and the applied aspect of this is that for diagnostic imaging we can use radioactive substances because these will accumulate selectively in that area of the tumor tissue because of increased angiogenesis there is no blood brain barrier there so the radioactive substances can easily uh, localize at that uh, center of tumor 
okay so that is the applied aspect of that another condition which the blood brain barrier can be deficient is during infection or injury so whenever there is infection or injury the blood brain barrier will be broken down and this is a good thing because it will facilitate the penetration of antibiotics to the brain for effective treatment and one more implication or applied aspect is that so you can temporarily weaken the blood brain barrier using hypertonic solutions so this can be used for enhanced drug delivery in treating diseases so that is another therapeutic implication of blood brain barrier so in a nutshell we've seen about the definition of blood brain barrier wherein we talked about both blood brain barrier and blood csf barrier we have seen the different components the tight junctions the basal lamina the astrocyte and all we've seen about the permeability of the substances we've seen the areas outside the blood brain barrier and finally the functions and applied aspect so i hope this concept is clear thank you